thank you very much, uh, moderator. And I can uh, hardly say what a pleasure it is to be uh, here today together with my editorial uh, colleagues uh, to launch this book, uh, Christianity in North Africa and West Asia. And let me begin with uh, a note of thanks to Anthony and the Centre for putting this conference together because I don't think we could imagine in, in this country uh, a gathering that would be more appreciative uh, of what is at stake for Christians in this uh, particular uh, region. And so to be uh, with you to launch the book is uh, really so apt and we're truly uh, grateful for it. Um, I should explain that the, the book has something of a dual identity. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's diophysite. I might have to <laughs> consult Sebastian uh, about that. Uh, but it does have a dual identity in the sense that it, it aims to be in its own right a book that will be of value uh, for the study of Christianity in this particular region with which we're uh, concerned in the current conference. But it is also part of, of a larger project, the Edinburgh Companions uh, to Glo Global Christianity, uh, which is aiming to consider uh, Christianity uh, right across the globe. And what we're proposing to do in, in this panel I'm going to take a few minutes to, to set it in that context and give a bit of background about the series as, as a whole. Uh, and then we'll circle back. Mariz is going to come next and, and focus in more uh, on the particular themes uh, of this volume, which will connect uh, very much with the discussions we've been having uh, this morning and uh, this afternoon. So the... Uh, project with which we're uh, concerned has a, uh, a bit of a backstory uh, to it. It has a, a precursor or, or a pilot uh, behind it, which is a book uh, published in 2009 uh, and entitled The Atlas of Global Christianity. The context in which this was uh, conceived was when we were in the run-up to the centenary of the Edinburgh 1910 World Missionary Conference that's often uh, cited as a kind of milestone in the uh, development of worldwide uh, Christianity. And in 1910, in that the original uh, conference, an atlas was, was created to kind of map the progress of uh, Christian mission throughout the world. And uh, that atlas was much to do with little red dots across the great expanses of Africa and Asia showing where mission stations had been established. And so it was thought fitting in the uh, centenary that we would have again an atlas, but of a very different uh, character, showing uh, large, numerous uh, Christian communities that have emerged in almost every part of uh, the world. And key player uh, in this was my um, editorial uh, colleague on the Atlas, Todd Johnson, and the center he directs at Gordon Conwell Seminary uh, in Boston, uh, with 50 years of experience in, in religious demography, and, and particularly uh, the demographic uh, profile of Christianity around the world. But Todd would be the first to say that if you simply produce statistics, uh, big uh, tables of, of numbers, for a lot of people, it, it doesn't really communicate uh, with them much. So he and his team were very eager to find attractive ways uh, of presenting the uh, statistics and the maps, the graphs, the tables uh, that were um, presented in the atlas were quite groundbreaking in doing this, but they had also found that numbers can be very telling. They can tell you a lot, but they don't tell you everything. So you need a narrative, an explanation, an interpretation uh, to sit alongside uh, the numbers. And so uh, the atlas is much made up of four-page spreads with two pages of maps and charts and graphs 
and the other two pages being an interpretative essay by a good scholar saying here here what what it's been all about in uh, this part of the world um, the atlas was was very well received um, it was a best-selling book for Edinburgh University Press and so in the few years after 2010 we, ha we had an ongoing discussion about whether the model that it uh, had developed could be taken further and it was out of this that the idea of the Edinburgh Companions to Global Christianity uh, emerged. Uh, the idea that we could have a uniquely detailed and comprehensive examination of Christianity on every continent. Uh, and you see here in the, the slide the ten uh, volumes that are envisaged. So you can see we're still at quite an early stage uh, in the uh, overall uh, project. Uh, but the aim at, at the end of uh, the day will be to have a consideration uh, of global Christianity that, that looks in some detail uh, at every country. And with this combination of uh, demographic analysis and uh, original uh, interpretative uh, essays, uh, mainly by indigenous scholars uh, in the field. So... Uh, last year, uh, 2017, uh, the first volume uh, appeared. It started with, uh, with Sub-Saharan uh, Africa, and uh, we're pleased to say this uh, volume also uh, has uh, had a very good uh, reception. And uh, 2018 uh, brings us to the uh, occasion that we are uh, in today, when we're able to launch Christianity in North Africa and West Asia. I should perhaps say a little bit about the title of this book, because I know for many of us who are involved in the, the field, this might not be the, the language that we would use for uh, the geography. We might talk about the Middle East or the Levant or the Maghreb. Um, but there is a very simple explanation of why this particular language is, is used. Uh, and that is every way that you divide up uh, geography is always controversial. Uh, and so we took a policy decision that we would use the United Nations uh, regions in this series. They're not perfect either, uh, but they do have the wide uh, acceptance uh, that a UN framework uh, gets. And so what we're doing in uh, this volume is, is looking at two of the UN uh, regions, uh, North Africa and uh, West Asia. And I don't think I need to um, explain here the uh, affinity uh, between the two. Uh, but it does perhaps give us just a bit of a a broader perspective, so the Gulf, the, the Caucasus, uh, the western part of North Africa is, is also uh, within the view, while it inevitably somehow the, 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 the heart of the matter uh, falls in uh, the Middle East. Uh, this volume and each of the, uh, the volumes has, has three main uh, sections uh, to it. Uh, the first is uh, country uh, level analysis. Uh, so every single country uh, is considered. Uh, the, the demography is, is given. Our, our standard framework for comparison uh, is to compare uh, 1970 uh, and 2015. Uh, and so in this, in this particular uh, volume, it shows rather uh, starkly the, the, the decline in the Christian presence in this uh, region, which was uh, eloquently uh, explained in, in the morning. Um, we try where, wherever we possibly can to have uh, indigenous authors. So in most cases, the, the author of a country essay uh, is someone who comes from that country. It's not inflexible. Occasionally, we do have uh, outside authors who've been very identified with the region and have particular expertise uh, to bring to bear. Uh, then secondly, 
uh, we have uh, consideration of ecclesial uh, traditions, uh, the main streams of, of Christianity. So uh, we have uh, standard five Orthodox, uh, Catholic, uh, Protestant, uh, Anglican, and Independent. And in addition to that, two movements that, that cut across the ecclesiastical uh, spectrum. These are the evangelical movement and the Pentecostal uh, charismatic movement. And we, we always need to have a bit of flexibility to, to adjust to the region we're dealing with. So in this particular uh, volume, there are two uh, orthodox essays, one on the Eastern uh, Orthodox and another uh, on the Oriental uh, Orthodox. Uh, and again, using our uh, critical insider uh, modality, uh, each tradition is, is, is written by someone who belongs uh, within the, the tradition. So we, we, we do require them to be rigorous and critical in their approach, uh, but it's, it's unashamedly written by, by someone who is uh, writing from inside and has the, the understanding and the uh, sympathy that comes uh, from that. And then our um, final uh, section is a, a thematic one uh, where we look at key uh, themes uh, and eight of these are uh, standard. I'm just looking them up because I'll probably forget uh, exactly what they are. There are eight uh, themes that run through all of the volumes and so they, they all appear in this volume in regard to uh, our uh, region. Uh, these are faith and culture, worship and spirituality, theology, social and political engagement, mission and evangelism, religious freedom, gender, and interfaith relations. But then we also have for each uh, volume the opportunity to select some themes that are salient uh, in the uh, particular uh, region with which we are concerned. And in this case, there are four uh, additional themes that are considered. One is monastic movements and spirituality. Second is ecclesiology. A third is Christian media. And a fourth is displaced uh, populations. And in addition to that, each um, volume has uh, an introduction uh, setting the scene uh, and a conclusion which draws the threads together and particularly takes a forward look into the future. It means uh, each time uh, building a, a big team of scholars uh, to, to make it happen. Uh, so we have for, for each volume three uh, editors. Um, so Todd and, and myself uh, bring our experience of, of editing the Atlas with Todd leading on the demographic side and uh, I'm leading on the more interpretative side. But then crucially for each of these uh, volumes, uh, we have a third editor uh, who has a specialist expertise on uh, the region with which we are concerned. Uh, and I can't tell you how fortunate we have been to have Mariz uh, as the third uh, editor in, in this case. And it really was a, a wonderful team of editors with whom to, to work through the three-year uh, period uh, of the project. Uh, the editors are also supported by an editorial advisory board of uh, five to six people and in this case, uh, we have uh, John Eibner, Kharach uh, Chilingirian, and uh, Anthony O'Mahony uh, here today. Uh, also, there is Elizabeth uh, Prodromu uh, and George uh, Sabra. And I would say, um, amongst the work that we've done so far, this has been an, an exceptionally uh, proactive and effective editorial advisory board. Uh, we began uh, at a meeting hosted by Mariz at the University of Sussex in, in 2015 with the, the conception and the, the planning of the volume. 
And I think if these colleagues had to go to their inboxes and count how many emails they had in the three years uh, since then, it, it might be a bit scary. Uh, but there was a, a just a wonderful collaboration uh, that uh, took place, meeting difficulties and overcoming them uh, and carrying um, them through. We also have uh, what I've called uh, technical support. This is especially on the, the demographic uh, side. So um, Todd's associate uh, director at the center in Boston, Gina uh, Zerlo, has been primarily responsible for, for collating and presenting the demographic uh, data. Uh, and she has a, a team of five others who have been uh, supporting that exercise. Uh, and then, of course, the cru crucially, uh, the authors, um, between 30 and 40 uh, for each uh, volume. And it's really their expertise, along with the reliable uh, demography, that, that will give these volumes their uh, authority. Uh, so we've been very, very fortunate in the uh, authors who have uh, worked hard to contribute to the, the volume. There's very little material reward for doing this. You, you get a copy of the book, which is, is something at least, um, but not even any um, uh, honorarium. Like many an academic project, it's rather on a uh, shoestring. Uh, so it's really been a labor of love. People who are committed to the region and the Christian uh, presence uh, within it who have worked uh, long and hard uh, to bring their uh, contribution, and we're very much uh, in their debt. Uh, we lean a lot on, on the demography, and I've mentioned uh, the center in Boston and the work that uh, it does, which finds its, its constant uh, output, output in the World Christian Database and the World uh, Religion uh, Database, which are both uh, published by uh, Brill in uh, Leiden. Uh, and these are the source of, of all the demography that uh, informs our volume. Uh, and once again, following from the Atlas, the attempt has, has been made uh, to present it in uh, attractive ways uh, in this volume. Um, little bit of, of a sales uh, pitch uh, here. And I would like to mention among this audience uh, one particular concern that we have about uh, the book, uh, and that is about making it available uh, within the region uh, itself. It would kind of go against our whole uh, ethos if, if it ended up sitting nicely on uh, the library shelves in, in Europe and North America, but was, was never available uh, in the region itself. And we were very pleased with our first volume, with the Africa uh, volume, that we were uh, able to uh, get grant awards from two uh, foundations who, who shared this vision and wanted to see the volume in key uh, institutions across the continent of Africa. Uh, and if you know of any such organizations or foundations who, who might um, have that kind of vision for this part of the world, we, we'd be very happy uh, to work on that. And this is very much with the collaboration of the uh, publishing house, Edinburgh University Press, because they are offering a 60% a uh, discount uh, for orders that come from within uh, the region. And that, that's the reason for this uh, last line on, on the ordering uh, slide, uh, that they will offer that uh, uh, discount, which means in, instead of the, uh, the full retail price of £150, uh, it's uh, £60. And I know it's still a lot of money in some uh, contexts, and that's why... Uh, we hope we might be able to identify some, some grant support that will uh, place the book in uh, key institutions uh, within uh, the region. Uh, but that's simply a whistle-stop uh, overview of the Edinburgh Companions uh, project as a whole. And I'm going to hand over to, to, to Mariz to 
take us in greater depth into this particular volume? The way we thought we would speak to this is rather than summarizing the content, uh, which you can easily get by uh, looking at the book, is to start with a series of provocations around the question that we keep on coming back to. Why is there this disconnect between how people in the region feel about their identity and how it is construed and how it is engaged with in the West? Um, obviously, some of it is age-old geostrategic interests, military interests, foreign policy interests. Um, but I would like to speak a little bit to um, the discursive and interpretive power of academic uh, framings and why um, this volume seeks to shift some of these framings through the cumulative uh, perceptions and evidence presented, whether through um, quantitative data or through the the, the, the evidence uh, given in um, people's narratives across the different parts of the volume. So what I thought we'd do is I'll start with five provocations or five myths mm -hmm. um, that have been very much in the mainstream of Western academia and policy discourses and ask, uh, and ask our contributors and members of the steering committee to reflect on whichever one of these myths they feel they are particularly enraged or empowered <laughs> to challenge. And then we'll take a break um, for five minutes, uh, or it's, five, it's, it's 10 minutes with, with the sort of the proclamation that it's five. Um, and then we'll come back again. And then we, I'll speak to five more myths um, that uh, are sort of propositions, and I'll ask our panel to engage with them. Um, these are, again, uh, sort of almost like a synthesis of some of the myths that we have sought to dispel in the introduction and conclusion, but also across the board in the 30 to 40 uh, chapters that um, uh, Ken spoke about. So the first, of course, is a major myth and a provocation in particular towards those in the academia, um, those in uh, the West that would like to situate themselves as um, um, progressive, as uh, emancipatory, as um, being totally disconnected from the colonialist past of, in particular, European countries. There is, especially among those that want, especially in, 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 in parts of uh, the US, but a lot across the UK, those that want to have nothing to do with the colonialist past of um, the UK and its European powers. And based on that, I think one of the ways they seek to reconcile that is to say, we don't do Christians because Christians are associated with the missionaries and the missionaries are associated with the colonialist powers. And therefore, we don't engage with Christians. And it's very interesting because that's where we see um, the double standards. Because while these very progressive academics who can engage with gender equality who can in engage with issues of racism, who can engage with issues of class and challenge systems and hierarchies in the global south when it comes to issues of religious minorities, Christians, Yazidis, whoever is not from the mainstream majority Muslim, then they say we don't do this because this has to do with the colonialists. What I, why I'm saying it's double standards because they don't afford the same normative um, interpretive framing when they come to engage with indigenous populations in Latin America. So while they can recognize the awful colonialist history of subjugating indigenous movements and populations in Latin America and other parts of the world, and they can defend indigenous populations on the basis of human rights, when it comes to Christian communities, there's a mutiny. So how can you, as an academic, find the ability to situate yourself in such a position where you can say, even though there is an awful colonialist history of eliminating indigenous populations, say in Brazil, um, and yet find the moral strength to say, actually, on account of universal human rights, we must still speak about the rights of indigenous people. When it comes to religious minority groups, whose, you know, if we talk about indigenous populations and the word in indigenousness being associated with having ancient heritages, and we have the same kind of parallel when we come to the Middle East, where we can talk about Christian communities um, 
going back to the first century AD, then, then suddenly it's as if Christianity started with the missionaries here, but indigenous populations can be traced back historically. So that's the big myth, I think, that people try to reconcile the lack of, the, the use of double standards is by saying all these Christians are from the colonialist time, as if the Christ Christians started in 18th, 19th century Europe. So that's the first myth. The second myth um, is the idea that Christians are suffering the fate they have because they are corollaries of the West. And that was a, a continued, re sort of a constant theme that many of the chapters spoke to, that they have somehow decided to side with the West and consequently, well, you know, if you side with the wrong part, you deserve what you get. Um, and it's very interesting because, of course, they then completely obliterate from this very essentialist and reductionist and misguided um, uh, association of alliances and coalitions, the fact that you've had Christian communities who have actually led uh, movements against colonialist powers. If you look at the role of the Coptic Orthodox Church against the colonial British colonialist regime in the 19th century, if you look at many other um, uh, churches and Christian communities standing against colonialists and neo-colonialists, if I add, if we look at the role of the Iraqis against certain um, imperialist ventures in modern, say, Iraq. But then, of course, this all gets wiped out and there is this perpetuation of the myth, a myth that I think is important for us to mention was initially created by the radical Islamists in the Middle East to justify policies of displacing and marginalizing Christians. The third myth, um, which I think is very interesting, and again, it speaks to in particular to policymakers and to the so-called progressive parts of academia, has to do with, um, let's be very careful here, not to, not, not, to not to show empathies with the Christian communities because that would be Islamophobic. And I think interestingly here, that myth is that, they ha that there is a, um, under the rubric of Islamophobia, uh, where, whereas academics tend to always talk about nuanced analysis, where you distinguish between different phenomena and different actors, when it comes to talking about Islamophobia, suddenly talking about ISIS becomes Islamophobic. Talking about, uh, com as in uh, Syria, where just as we saw, where com where Syria commun Syrian communities, Christian and Muslim, are saying these are foreign elements; they don't represent the kind of Islam that has been practiced here for hundreds of years. Even making such a statement, where we are talking about distinguishing between different kinds and forms and manifestations of of Islam, just 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 criticizing a movement that has Islam in it becomes Islamophobic. All the while, the, this kind of glossing over isn't replicated when we come to talk about um, other political movements um, in the West. So nobody says that the Ku Klux Klan, the Christian Democratic Party in Germany, and the Church of England are all spectrums of Christianophobia. If we critique one, it does not equate with the other. And yet the same is, 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 is afforded when we come to talk about critiques of different movements in the region. So that's the third myth, that in order for you to show cultural sensitivity to be politically correct, don't engage in Islamophobia, and that means don't engage in any critique of militant forms that's, that use the word Islam in their name. The fourth myth, is, well, actually, um, Christians have always supported autocrats. And therefore, given the fact that they have a streak towards uh, a, a love affair with authoritarianism, well, you know, do you really want to support a movement, a, a part of a community that is a proxy for support for totalitarian regime? And again, that's very, very interesting. I mean, you have journalists like Robert Fisk who have particularly spearheaded the movement of saying Christians in Syria, in Egypt, uh, and other parts of the region have, Iraq, have supported autocrats. And therefore, it is completely expected that those that are on the emancipatory side of politics, those that want free and democratic regimes, it is expedient that they would look to the Christian communities as, as sources of, um, 
um, um, uh, undermining the, 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 the potential for freedom in the region. The problem with that, again, is twofold. Is that, first of all, there is no distinction between, uh, first of all, there is a, 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 no distinction between what uh, different forms of expressions of Christian faith expressions of Christian agency there are in the region. In other words, when the youth in, in Egypt rose against both Mubarak and Pope Shenouda and participated in the Egyptian revolution, suddenly there was talk about, oh, well, the Copts are rising. But, but they were part of liberation movements. They were part of political parties and coalitions that were against the Mubarak regime for, for decades. Um, and yet there is suddenly, oh, well, actually all Christian, all Christian communities are represented through their leader and the leader creates coalitional coalitions with the, with the autocrat and there you have it, they deserve what they get. So what I'm trying to say is that this myth is, is based on um, a total negation of the plurality of Christian actors, a total negation of the plurality of Christian forms of expression, a total negation of the way in which people have participated in different liberation movements for better or for worse at different points in the history of the region. The final number, the final myth for now bef before we take reflections and then we come back for coffee. So this is myth number five before we come to deal with the last five myths. Um, is, well, actually, um, Christians are almost, they're presented almost as if they're sheep to their patriarchs or leaders. That they, their only identity is um, as worshippers, as parishioners, and therefore the problem um, with that is um, uh, for you, the, the, there is almost a, a, a lack of... Um, multiplicity of identities because your only identity is as someone who is subservient to your patriarch. Again, it is a problem which is not accorded. It's, it's, a, it's a myth that is not engaged with in the same manner when we talk about indigenous populations. So with, when we talk about indigenous populations in Latin America, there's a discourse that recognizes that there are certain indigenous leaders, but then there are indigenous women's movements and that there are indigenous youth, and there's a variety, there's a, a, a recognition that people have multiple identities. But when it comes to this region, suddenly people have only one identity. As, as members of a denomination who obediently and unquestionably uh, engage with the patriarch or the leader. And that means that there is no recognition for youth and the way in which youth in exercise their agency in its intersection with the religious identity in a variety of ways. There's no recognition for people in their political identity, the way, for example, the at some point historically, the uh, Christian intellectuals in the Levant contributed to the emergence of Arab pan-nationalism. Again, for better or for worse, it's another aspect of their identity. There is no recognition for the way in which gender intersects, intersects with religious identity. All of this suddenly wiped out. And wh what you have is, oh, these are followers of the faith, as if they don't have a number of other identities that intersect with their identity as, uh, uh, as Christians. This is not to deny their Christian identity. This is to say that their Christian identity intersects with other identities, belongings, um, affiliations that are also important for us to engage with. So I will stop there. Uh, I will stop there. Um, so these are the five myths that a lot of these um, uh, contributions in our volume spoke to and we'll get some reflections and then after the break we'll engage with five more provocations or myths that this volume has sought to challenge um, uh, cumulatively. Thank you. <laughs>